every year, radio station WHO at Des Moines picks out the worst rundown farm we can find in the state of Iowa. We go in there with a multiple series of tractors and game plows and rehabilitate the farm to the extent of about a hundred thousand dollars in one day. A few years ago, we invited Thomas Dewey to come out and address that gathering, for the multitudes came from 13 states. We had 130,000 people there. We parked uh, 30,000 cars and 150 planes. Thomas Dewey said, Iowa is Republican, it always has been Republican, and why should we waste any good Republican money in a good Republican state? So he turned us down. We invited Harry Truman to come, me and Harry. <laughs> Harry accepted. The result was that we had this big crowd. We were eating lunch in the tent, and it was hot as it can be hot in Iowa. And out of respect for the President of the United States, everybody was wearing a coat. And I said to Mr. Truman, who sat right opposite to me in this narrow table, I said, Mr. President, any man that wears a coat here has a dirty shirt. That's what I said to Justin. He took his coat off. He took his coat off. And that goes for the women, too. You know, they a few years ago, we made a trip down to the Southern Islands, and we saw fit to write a book, which was issued last September by Rand McNally in Chicago, entitled Upside Down and Right Side Up with B.J., because when you're below the equator, you're upside down, and when you're upside down below the equator, you're right side up. It also wrote up the story, the best story that was ever written on the lost cities of Angkor Tham in old Cambodia. The book is 1,048 pages with 530 pictures. It was issued last September. The book cost us $16,000. It is not yet entirely paid for. Now, I would like everyone who will tomorrow purchase a copy of that book, please stand. According to that, I'll get enough money tomorrow to pay the balance of the bill. <laughs> we thank you. In 1895, an incident of worldwide historical human value took place. Harvey Leonard became deaf. 
He was in a stoop, cramped position when he heard something pop in his neck. He was deaf for 18 years. In his neck was a large visible bump. Fortunately, it could be seen. Otherwise, it might have gone unnoticed. D.D. D. Palmer said, if the production of that bump produced deafness, reduction of that bump should restore hearing. Fortunately, that bump was reduced, and fortunately, hearing was restored. That incident started and established a truth heretofore unknown and unused. I ask you, would the average man, upon a single isolated case, have discovered a universal human principle and practice? Was that man justified? in laying down an all-complete, all-inclusive, and all-exclusive universal human principle. Fifty-eight years has justified that conclusion. Chiropractic is based upon the fixed facts of physics. The matter cannot move without force or energy. That human matter is in motion as human energy gets to that matter. That human matter moves in speed, in exact ratio as the quantity of human energy predetermines as delivered to that human matter. More mind in more matter equals more motion. The matter moves as it's moved upon by energy. Moving composite beings are alive. Inanimate composite beings are dead. To move is to live. Motion is life. To not move is to be dead, and no motion is death. A necessity for motion, and to be unable to control motion, is this ease. Matter cannot move without energy to move it. So the quality of living is an element entirely within the knowledge and province of innate intelligence resident within us. Matter moves at a normal rate of speed when man is well. When it does, matter lives and is healthy. Reduce the speed by reducing the quality of energy that moves it, and you reduce the quantity and quality of production of its product and its byproducts, and it is as simple as that. Life or living matter or matter action at normal rate of speed is because of a continuity flow of energy through a continuity of matter. Break the continuity of matter or the continuity of energy, and you break the continuity of action with its consequent reduction in product and byproducts. Cut a nerve in two by intention or through an accident. Somewhere between the brain and the end of that nerve in the body, and you have broken the continuity of the medium which carried the continuity of energy flow. If the nerve is in natural continuity, as it was intended to be in human beings, between brain and the end of that nerve in the body, then the continuity of energy flow is normal, and the individual will be well unless it's broken. The constant which comprises the scientific fundamental upon which chiropractic rests is an accident of some kind, one of many kinds, introduces the external concussion of force, which, when it meets resistance with the body it contacts, produces a concussion of forces, one invasionary, the other resisting, which, because of the clash and concussion of forces betwixt and between, being the vertebral column, 
subluxates a vertebra of the spinal column, which in turn produces an occlusion and a pressure and an interference to flow and creates dis-ease. The chiropractic practice is to locate the exact vertebral subluxation and ascertain its precise abnormal position, then by hand only, efficiently give it an adjustment to correct its malposition, which opens the occlusion, releases the pressure, restores the transmission, and given time, produces health. And it is as simple as that. All energy for all the body is resident in all the brain. Each part of the brain produces all the energy for that part of the body. Cut off or reduce that normal quantity of brain energy from going to some part of the body, and it reduces its tissue speed, reducing its working product or byproducts, and the individual becomes sick. And if entirely cut off, would be dead. The brain is the life source. The spinal nerves and spinal cord merely convey or transmit that life force to all parts of the body. The human brain is a human dynamo. The human body is a series of human motors. The human nervous system is a series of transmitters of human energy, both efferent and afferent, completing circuits, generating, conveying, and acting human electricity. Each nerve circuit, brain to body and body back to brain, is independent in brain production, nerve transmission, and tissue cell speed of action. Yet, simultaneously, dependent from all others, as all others are dependent upon it. But this human innate mind is a great intellectual director, regulator, or controller of human energy. For mind is a thought force. If the brain generates the thought force, the nerves convey thought energy, the body expresses that mental function, the body will be healthy in all parts. If the normal quantity of mental impulses get through from brain to all parts of the body. So you see how easy and simple the whole problem is. A vertebral subluxation can be aptly compared to a dam. The vertebral subluxation squeezes the opening through which nerves pass. The reduced size of this opening produces a pinching or pressure upon nerves. Build a dam across the river, and you produce a similar condition. The dam backs up water behind the dam. This keeps water from going through and getting below the dam. The vertebral subluxation acts as a dam on the nerves or spinal cord. This stops the blow forward and backs it up behind. This damning back of human nerve force produces a stuffy, full, congested feeling behind the obstruction in the head. It also keeps nerve force current from flowing forward below the obstruction, starving the territory below, which would be otherwise fed by that nerve force flow. When a dam gate is opened, the water is permitted to flow through, and when an adjustment is given to the vertebral subluxation, the nerve force flow is permitted to flow freely to the places above or the places below. And this receive, relieves the congestion above and feeds the starved area below the dam. And health is thus reestablished. Getting sick people well is as simple as that. Now, chiropractic having a right formula for getting sick people well does get sick people well. 
if chiropractic was wrong, it would fail to get sick people well. Chiropractic being right, it is applicable in 100% of cases. If it was wrong, it would apply in no case. The chiropractic principle and practice being fundamentally sound, then it is right all the way. Vital and fundamental principles have a definite fixed approach and application which are not subject to the caprices and idiosyncrasies of men. If they were, chaos in all fundamentals would exist. In this category are found all sciences. It is that stability which makes it a science. Well, this regulatory factor is not a matter of individual opinion in which one may make it six and another make it eight. It is always four, no matter who, why, where, or how. It is this fixed rule of mathematics which makes it a science. Chemistry and astronomy are two more having fixed principles and practices. It is that ability to agree on fundamentals that makes scientists. It is that inability to agree on fundamentals that draws the sharp line between scientists and theorists, realists and sophists. If everyone who called himself a mathematician, a chemist, or astronomist had personal reasons for rules of his own, there could and would be no scientific value to any common fundamental on which they could or would agree. Sciences are based on fixed formulae. But the only reason they are is because they work. Chiropractic has a scientific fixed success formula that works when it's worked. I recall some years ago, we were coming from the South Pacific Islands. We stopped at the Tin Can Islands of Nianfu because that was the one place in the world where there was this, an eclipse of the sun that day. And all the astronomers of the world had gathered in Nianfu to photograph that eclipse of the sun. Coming home on the boat were many astronomers. And I said to the astronomer from the Department of Astronomy of the University of West Virginia, one night we were sitting out on the deck, I said, Professor, tell me, how near did your various astronomers that was gathered from all the world, Siberia, Russia, Norway, Sweden, uh, Denmark, Belgium, France, Germany, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, China. How near did you agree as to when that eclipse would begin and when it would end? He said, we all agreed to the second, both coming and going, with the exception of one man. Well, I said, how much was he off? He was off one half a second. That's what makes astronomy a science. It is this ability to lay aside the differences of views, agree on fundamentals, hold the differences of opinions on everything else, which enables scientists to find factual data and then agree. Somewhere between the law of facts of living beings, wandering through the maze of the failures of the practice of medicine, there is a law to life, to which and through which all the so-called phenomena of life and death, sickness and health apply. There is a health success formula that works somewhere. Time, place, and individual opinions do not change the fact. They only mislead one in searching for the right formula. When that chiropractic success formula is used, medical mysteries disappear and common sense will be understood. 
instead of the very fertile sick field being under intensive health cultivation, producing bumper crops of healthy people, there exists a medieval jungle of undergrowth of weeds, impenetrable and impassable, with many sowing wild weeds to make it worse. Each science has its law, for which no man who professes to be an advocate and a follower can escape. His beginning, his boundaries, his circumscribed path are defined and confined by it. No man can work against law and expect law to work with him. That is the law of law. Where is the medical man who, with all his medical education, could artificially make and direct the function of one tissue cell? Yet the innate intelligence, living, directing, and regulating all the tissue cells and functions in the mother, builds entire baby bodies. That is the wisdom the chiropractor prefers to permit to get sick people well. This reasoning is equally true in man. His conception, gestation, development, birth, life, death, health, sickness, and restoration back to health. It was and is governed by law. It has been governed by law for millions of years in millions of bodies. It is governed by law now in millions of people. To know that law and to work with that law is to know how they get sick people well. That law is simple in principle and practice. As two times two makes four, not sometimes, but always. A chiropractor knows that law and works with it. That's why it gets sick people get well. And it is as simple as that. Chiropractic has discovered and developed knowledge of that law that has always existed and fills the great void for that law in the application to manly sickness. Chiropractic destroys nothing, replaces nothing, substitutes nothing, neither is it iconoclastic against any present-day satisfactory order of things in conformity with that law. Chiropractic is an original and new principle in practice as compared with all others in its field of effort, and was born of a necessity to make possible a long sought for hitherto impossibility. The automobile did not replace the horse, even though both were transportation methods. The electric light did not substitute kerosene, even though both sought light. Neither does chiropractic substitute medicine though both desire health to the sick. Each in its turn and place incorporated a new principle, a new practice, and a new result. Chiropractic has fundamental postulates of science, has constants for scientific, logical procedure, possesses essential processes to base its science on. Therefore, it meets the exacting demands of proving itself in terms of science. Chiropractic fundamentally does get sick people well because it has well-defined, well-identified scientific principles step by step in sequence from health to dis-ease and from dis-ease back to health. Hence, chiropractic locates and corrects a true specific of cause and cure of disease. Chiropractic, like all sciences, always works and does attain the same ends of any science when scientists work with it, apply the correct rules which established it as a science. Chiropractic is natural, created before men not by man. Chiropractic is as powerful as any other power contained within and liberated by law or by any other natural power 
or anything natural. It has nothing artificial in its makeup. It is reason and logic within every bound of logic and reason. In the abstract, it is broad enough to cover the entire human race and limited enough to apply to one person. Its very appeal to human understanding lies in its dynamic simplicity. Medicine to the average individual is a mysterious principle in practice. It too can be reduced to a simple formula. Weaving through the multiplicity of diagnostic names and prescriptions, it boils down to two diseases. To rapid action for one type, to slow action for the other. And then, that's why you find so many hyper and hypo prefixes to their names, for which it has two kinds of drug treatments, to inhibit the stimulation, to stimulate the inhibition. In other words, hypo the hyper and hyper the hypo. Two general kinds of drugs to treat two general kinds of diseases. A good example that comes to comes readily is the heart and its action. If it beats approximately 72 times a minute, we have normal pumping action and the heart health exists. If it beats 85 times a minute, it is not pumping too fast, and a heart this is diagnosed as tachycardia exists. For this, the physician would give some drug which would inhibit the rapid action. What kind of drug or how much to give might be difficult for him to decide. If it beats 60 times a minute, it is now pumping too slowly. And an opposite type of heart disease, diagnosed as bradycardia, exists. For this, the physician would give some drug which would stimulate the slow action. What kind of drug or how much to give still might be difficult for him to decide. So he tries this or that until he thinks he knows. The chiropractor does not work with that principle. He adjusts and permits a restoration of the normal quantity of an internal innate flow of force, which is inherently and intellectually resident within the body, which alone knows the proper quantity to establish the proper quality of function necessary to establish health, which is internally automatic within us, which calls for no empiric or arbitrary opinion of ours. And it is as simple as that. Physicians have a medical concept that the body lives within itself when it's healthy. But when sick, it needs some external agency to give it health. So they prescribe chemicals, antis, and other neutralizing agencies under stimulative or inhibitive or neutralizing processes to make it well. They work on the principle of asserting they know what the unbalance is. Then by stimulation or inhibition, force it either up or down, arbitrarily and empirically, to a standard which they think they know. If it goes too high, they bring it down. If it goes too low, they force it up. The chiropractor does not know that normal power. Only the resident intelligent force within us does know. So we leave all of that to it. It is as simple as that. When drugs are given, it is with the assumption that the physician knows what is wrong, his diagnosis is infallible, the physician knows the exact failure chemical formula, therefore knows the exact correct chemical formula to give. If it is a stimulated condition, he knows exactly how much 
of an inhibitor to give the balance. If it's an inhibited condition, he knows exactly how much of a stimulant to give the balance. He knows what the balance is, or should be, without possibility of error. When he gives a drug by way of the stomach, the stomach knows just where the physician wants it to send it, and sends it there without deviation or deflection. For instance, if it were rheumatism in the right big cow, the stomach would not send it to the left big cow. The chiropractor presumes no such understanding. He adjusts at the location of the interference. This is all he can do. The brain generates the right quantity of force in health and sickness. The nerves now convey that right quantity of thought force to their periphery. Wherever those nerves go, where the dis-ease is, to the place or places where it should go. When the normal quantity arrives, it knows exactly what to do and how to do it to produce the right quantity and quality of life. All the things I don't know, it does. That is intellectually, internally controlled, and is at all times beyond my reach. It is either sickness, health, life, or death. And I couldn't control it if I wanted to. And I couldn't control it no matter how much education I did or did not have. You do not control the quantity of electricity when you turn on the button, or tell the electricity where to go, or tell the electricity when to go. Neither do you stimulate or inhibit the wires or globe or their excess or minus quantities. It goes when you turn on the button. When it arrives, it gives light. Some men doubt and even deny the existence of a vital life force. And then they run into trouble. So you see how simple it is. Now, people have been taught that germs cause disease. That isn't true. You can vaccinate an entire community and make them sick to keep one person that is sick from getting well. Simple, isn't it? The cause of disease is not a communistic thing. And I don't mean that in the political sense. This idea that the community makes a person sick. Or we've got to do something to the community to get the one sick person well is wrong. The cause of disease is not in the community. The cure of disease is not in the community. The cause is individualistic. And the cure is individualistic within the individual. So you see how simple it is? After all, no government can long survive when the individual and his responsibility are ignored and all his responsibility shed upon the community. No government arrives anywhere until the individual has been taught to assume his responsibility, after which the community action is automatic, wherein the many are made up out of the one. All experience that survives in the cause and cure of disease is based upon a knowledge that the cause and cure of disease is within the individual. And this is not a responsibility that he can shed upon his neighbor and blame him for it. But any health method ignores the individual in its equation and casts that blame upon the community, he professes his ignorance of the cause and cure of disease as it exists in the individual, and thus proves his incompetence to be of service to an individual, except as he tries to reach him through community welfare. The cause of smallpox is in the individual, not the community. The cure of smallpox lies in the individual, not in wholesale vaccination of the community. Physicians admit that some people are immune, others are fertile culture grounds, some resist better than others. 
those who resist are stronger and are more able to cast off. And you ask any physician, why of a thousand people, five are down with smallpox? You say the 995 are able to resist the invasion. What makes resistance? It's that internal power that flows from within that builds up the resistance to the invasion of anything. Then why blame the community and vaccinate them all? An individual with a subluxation will resist less and one without will resist more. Resistance from within is fundamental. With it we resist and without it we invite invasion. All schools of health are agreed upon this principle as sound. Germs exist. We don't deny their presence. We deny them as a cause of disease. I think it's safe to say that if throat swabs were made of everybody in this room tonight, you would find that the most of you have tuberculotic germs, you have typhoid germs, you have malarial germs, you have smallpox germs, and you have several kinds of germs in your body right now. But are you sick? No, because your body can resist them. Germs are scavengers. They help to keep the alleyways of the sick body clean. They eat it up, the same as we send rats out to eat our garbage. The rats don't cause the garbage to be there. It's the balance of nature in keeping up the balance between scavenger matter and scavengers. You see, when the chiropractor affirms this principle of the necessity of internal resistance in the individual and then practices that by making the internal resistance naturally possible in the individual, flowing from within, he confirms his consistency in principle and practice. I don't, I recall, as I told you the other day on this great surgeon who came, I don't think we ever convinced him in any way, but look what it did for his wife. Now as a practical observer, watching the efforts of medical men, this part brings back to my mind, just flashes through, some years ago, I was to lecture in Portland, Oregon. And I had been reading several medical books, and it talked all about the phenomena of medicine, which called to my mind that some years before that I'd been down in Kentucky. And I saw a great big fat Negro sitting on a split rail fence. And I said, Sam, it seems to me that with this fertile soil you have here, you ought to raise a good crop. I said, yeah. And I said, it seems to me with this sun beating down, you ought to raise a fine crop. Yep. Well, it seems to me if you had a little rain, you could wear, build some fine crops here. Yep. I said, it seems to me that with a little energy, you could do a lot of things here. And he said, yep. Well, I said, what are you waiting for? He said, I'm just waiting for that little energy. So some years ago, as I say, I was reading some books on this phenomena of faith, the phenomena of medicine, the phenomena of this. And incidentally, there isn't a doctor, a physician, or surgeon alive that can tell you in advance the effect of any one drug on any one person. There is no specific in medicine. Why? Because the imponderables of the human individual makes the prescribing of a drug an imponderable in its result. Yet the innate possesses no imponderabilities. The innate is a fixed law that always works. I was making this trip out to Portland. I was reading medical books about this phenomenal thing, and I was discouraged. So I went out on the highway and I walked down the road. And I saw a horseshoe. I stooped down and picked it up. And I said, gee, now I'm going to get good luck. Found a horseshoe. 
Went along a little further, I found another horseshoe. I said, now I'm going to get double good luck. Went along a little further, I saw another horseshoe. I picked it up and I said, now triple good luck's coming my way. I turned around and started towards town, and I come across a whole pile of horseshoes. Then I realized it was a question of junk. And I think the same thing is true with physicians. You get one physician, one diagnosis. You get two physicians, two diagnoses, two horseshoes. You get third physician in a conference, and then you've got three horseshoes. By the time you get four of them, you've got junk for the undertaker. The medical profession seek, aim, and to destroy what they think are human life destroyers. They're supposed to lurk like murderers in every dark crevice and crack and corner in your body, in the air, the wood, the water, the food, even inside the man. And so they fluoridate the water to kill the germs to keep you well when health comes from within. That's why we have well water here. Every, everywhere, everywhere are multitudinous microbes, some so small that even an electron microscope magnifying a hundred thousand times can't find them. These natural products, as natural as man himself, conceived and created by innate designed by inner to fill all natural functions are exhibited by man alone as horrible examples of mistakes of inner. I wonder how those people figure out that God actually made the world. Now you see, he made all these devils to decimate man. And yet he's been doing a pretty good job of it for millions of years. I don't see how they can confuse the two ideas. I couldn't, and I don't see how they can in this endless struggle. Now the ordinary sick person starts out as an acute case. Yesterday he had an accident. Today he's got a little feeble. Mother gets a little anxious and worries, and so she calls the doctor. The doctor said, I don't know what to call this yet because I'll have to wait until it develops. So he hangs around for four or five days and the temperature keeps going up, gets up to 102.6. He said, I don't know quite yet. We'll wait and see if there's a breaking out. Then it breaks out and now he said, we have an eruptive fever. We uh, think that it may be varilite. It might be scarlet fever. It might be measles. We'll wait a few days. Meanwhile, you just give the child this and this and this. And eventually, someday, the case goes from the acute stage into the chronic stage. Maybe they're deaf. Maybe they're crippled. Maybe they're this, that, and the other thing. I recall, I think I told the pre lyceum class last year that at one time, we had quite a number of polio cases in our student clinic. And the health officer of the city of Davenport came up and he said, Now, B.J., you've got to report all these because we passed an ordinance that you've got to report these cases so we can quarantine them. And I said, John, tell me, John Muller was his name. I said, John, tell me, what are the symptoms of the pathologies of polio? Well, he said, we don't know. That's why we're quarantining him so we can find out. <laughs> and I said, all right, John, when you know what polio is and can come and tell me, then I'll know what polio is, then I'll know what to report to you so that you can quarantine him. <laughs> and that was the end of that. They never quarantined any of our cases because I didn't know what to report to them for quarantine. 
a little common sense knocks down a lot of scientific nonsense. And I knocked it in the cocked hat. That was that. You know what a specialist is? He's a man who knows more and more about less and less. He spends a lifetime on the eye, the ear, the nose, the throat, the heart, the stomach, or what have you. And then what? He's forgotten that the eye, the ear, the nose, the throat, the heart, or the stomach is a part of the rest of the body. So he becomes a specialist on that one thing. After all, innate is on top of all parts of that body and knows that no one part can live unto itself. They've got to coordinate themselves and innate knows how to coordinate them. So you see, after all, it's just as simple as that. Now the chiropractor changes this whole picture. Instead of sickness and recovered health being a highly specialized and complex subject, which only a few university graduates understand only a mere small part of, it now becomes a simple subject, in fact so simple that any man on the street can have it explained and understand, knows what to do, where to go, to get well. It is so simple that the students of this school can't understand it. 80% of our time is spent to telling those students why germs don't cause disease. And 20% trying to pump something in about a vertebral subluxation and an interference to innate. 80% backing up what his grandmother and great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother or grandfather has been pumping into him for centuries. And we've only got four little insignificant years to unbreed the breedings of centuries. I can't see why he can't see the obvious, but they rarely do. You see, the very successful objectives denies the things, and yet he keeps pumping it back to us all the time. I've had it right here in last week's work. I'll have it in some of my questions tomorrow. I'll bet you a dollar against every person in this house that tomorrow I get some damn fool questions about what I've been talking about all week. <laughs> but just remember that the transition from the old order of things to the new order of things is a question of growth. And growth is a question of time. I was talking to a certain chiropractor who was in the tent tonight, and that person asked me a certain question. Now, that person is a very fine chiropractor. And yet, there was one phase of this whole subject that wasn't known to that chiropractor until last week. And the talk that I gave Sunday morning, that person came to me and said, B.J., now I have grown one step further. You see, it takes time, and time is the great factor. The people didn't buy Henry Ford's car, the first one he produced. They laughed at it and scoffed at it. They said, have a team hitched up in the livery stable and get ready because he may call for you. How do I know? I had the first gasoline automobile west of the Mississippi. And I know once in a while we had to call on a team, too. <laughs> they wasn't perfected yet. But how people used to laugh at me, and I was so afraid that the people wouldn't know who owned the car that I put my name on the side, on both sides of it. That was the day of the horseless carriage. And I know when the farmers came to town with their eggs and chickens, once in a while a team would run away. 
You'd see chickens all over the streets and eggs spilled all over the streets and broken. And they sued me for damages. My defense was if you had a good harness on the horses, you would have held them so they wouldn't have run away. And I always got out of it. <laughs> so I know what it means to be a pioneer. I recall when we were first starting it with radio, some 36 years ago with WOC, I went to the banker. I said, Mr. Banker, what do you think about this radio thing? Looked at me and said, B.J., it's a plaything. It's a plaything for kids. The fool needs money or soon part. Don't waste any money on it. Then I went to the editor of a newspaper, put the same question to him. He said, B.J., a fool needs money soon part. This kid plaything. Don't waste any money on it. Here about five years ago, I was offered $200,000 for WHO. I went down to the banker. And I said, what do you think? Here's a letter from the National Broadcasting Company offering me $200,000 for WHO. And he said, BJ, by all means, take it. That's $200,000 in the bank. Take it. <laughs> Less than one year later, I had a, another letter from the National Broadcasting Company asking me to sell at the beginning price of two million. The beginning price, from that up, whatever we'd ask for it. I took that letter down to it. <laughs> he put his hands up, sort of shading and hiding his nose, and he said, well, we can all make mistakes. I know what it means to be a pioneer, and I know how people laugh at us. But somehow it didn't stop me. Thirty-six years ago, I laid down this principle. This is a community station owned by the community for community service. That has been always our watchword in the use of that station. And we've never missed fire with it. At the same time, 36 years ago, I said, the day will come when we will bring the world to your ears. We will bring the world to your eyes, and we'll bring it in color. 36 years ago. We've been bringing it to the ears for 36 years. We're now bringing it to the eyes the last five years with WOC. And now we're broadcasting color. So after all, where was the vision? It takes guts, intestinal fortitude, to have a vision and stand by it until it comes through. We sunk $440,000 in WOC before we were able to get our first commercial dollar back from it. But oh boy, we've got it back since. The chiropractic principle is simple. The practice is simple. The results for the sick are simple. Providing a success formula is correctly and efficiently followed. You know something? I'm an ignoramus. I suddenly was quituated from the high school the first half of the first year. Will Logie that run a chain of drug stores and Will Hickey that runs a chain of cigar stores and myself, we took some live rats to school in cigar boxes. In the study room where there was about 400 students, about half of them girls. And we turned them loose, the rats. And the girls jumped up on the desk and pulled their skirts up. Well, that's why we did it. <laughs> And we was all fired, expelled. I never went back. So I'm an ignorant man. What do I know about chemistry? All I know is H2O means water, and I don't know that. I just think that's so. Maybe it is, maybe it ain't. What do I know about bacteriology and microscopy? Nothing. 
What do I know about a lot of this junk that we're compelled to teach here in order to go around and prove to the world that we're highbrows? I don't know those things, and yet you super intelligent people come here and listen to an ignoramus talk. There's a subluxation that makes sick people well, and I know how to correct it. That's all I need to know. From then on, everything else that we want done or hope to have done, either from the patient's point of view or ours, is up to innate, and that's in the individual and not in me. I recall some years ago, I went to Beelings in West Virginia, opened an office upstairs in Longfellow's Hall. All I had, all I had was a suitcase adjusting cable. I had nothing else. But within my mind, I was a disciple of my father. My father said, the cause of all disease lies in the backbone. And being a good St. John or St. Peter, I believed it. And I went out on the highways and the byways and began punching backbones, ignorant little kid of 18. And I was getting sick people well. Why did I succeed? I was making $200 a day. Kid 18. Ignorant. All I had was a head and hands and a little table. But rattling around in that head was an idea. And that idea was propounded by my father as I sat at his feet night after night and listened to him say, it works. And I went out with that idea. And I've never gotten away from that idea one minute, one thought from that day to this very hour. <laughs> I was talking to some great educator the other day. He was lauding my achievements, and I took it all modestly. But at the same time, I was thinking what a fool he was. <laughs> and he said, BJ, there's one thing I admire you for. And I said, what's that? Your consistency down through the years. The consistency, insistency, and persistency. And after all, when you've got that inner deep conviction that you know it works, when you know it works, there's nothing to take it away from it. I recall when I was down in Florida last winter, Herb Hender came down and saw me, spent a few days or a week or two with me, and we was talking one night as cronies will, professional talk. Herb asked this question. He said, B.J., have you ever known anybody who ever got the big idea that has ever forsaken it or denied it? And I got to thinking, there's Mary Jane Gatz, there's Tina Martin, there's Dr. This and Dr. That. I went over the list as they flashed to my mind. And I said, no, Herb, I've never known one that got the idea that ever forsook it are denied it. And that is true. It's only the people that don't get the bigness of the simplicity of this simple principle and practice that forsake it and deny it. I've often think, I thought since I was over in the Palestine, the Holy Land, here is a simple man bringing forth a tremendous principle the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. That's what it amounts to when you boil it down to its essence. And he was going around preaching the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And he didn't make any discrimination between white man and black man, yellow man or red man, 
Jew or Gentile, Mohammedan or Buddhist. The principle he laid down was big enough for all the world, for all time to come. And then where did he pick up his uh, disciples? Simple little fishermen from the Sea of Galilee. Simple men. He went around preaching that gospel. And he wasn't understood by very many people. But time, time, time has grown the understanding of that simple principle. The strength of the Christian principle is in its simplicity not in its complexity. If we could just get that principle over. Now, let me see if I can give you an idea. I'm going to take a trip into a chiropractor's office. The patient comes in that's sick. First thing he does is take this little bottle. And then let me take your pulse beat and let me do this, that, and the other thing. Give me some sputum. I want to take some of the earwax out of your ears. And he goes through a long rigmarole. And then eventually he diagnoses. And then he says to the person, Now I can't do anything for you for uh, at least two or three weeks. I'll have to look up in the books and see what I am to do for you and what I am to give you. And he complexes the thing fearfully. He said, I'll have to look up and see what my anatomy says about this muscle and that muscle. I'll have to see whether this nerve or that nerve is involved. I'll have to see uh, uh, whether this organ or that organ is involved. I'll have to see whether it's this viscera or that one, this system or that system. And that will take me at least three weeks to go back over the armamentarium that was pumped into me in the chiropractic school. Come back now in three weeks. And so he exhibits a marvelous intellectuality of complexity. Now, does he? No. If all of you did that, you wouldn't have any business. On the reverse, here's what you do, and you know you do it. Doggone you. A patient comes in. Something's wrong. You don't know what it is. You don't know where it is. And you don't care where it is or what it is. But you do know. There's a verbal subluxation. You take him in, you get a spanograph. You want to know where the interference is. You use a neurocolon or neurocalograph, chirometer. You'll find where the interference is. Then you say, lay down here, biff, bang, back for you. And the patient gets up. Is that all? That's all that I can do. It ain't will do all the rest. Now, what about all your bacteriology and your chemistry and all this other junk? Do you use it? You know you don't. And I know you don't. You're not kidding me one minute. I know that the moment you pass your basic science board and the moment you pass your chiropractic state board out in the alley with the junk, to be a chiropractor with a simple principle, simple practice, attaining a new simple result that the world has been seeking for for 5,000 years. Do you grasp the importance of that? That we have in our hands and in our heads the thing that one thing, the key that unlocks the door that in it can open and flow through. We are about, well, you know, ivory soap, 99, 44, 100% pure, it floats. Well, we are the other 60th percent of 1%. And in it is the 99, our 44, 100% pure because it floats. That's how simple this thing is. And yet you blow yourself all up. I make no pretense to wanting to be a blow up on these things. I don't know them. I don't want to know them. All I want is to be able to do the thing that's necessary to be done, after which I want to know that it is there to do the rest of it. 
When I go into some of these chiropractors' offices like I... I went into one big office out in California some years ago. He had four floors of stuff. <laughs> he called me in. I went in. I was invited, and I went in. And as we started to go from one thing to another, from one floor to the other, I said, Tell me, doctor, is this good for rheumatism? Oh, that's the finest thing in the world. We went over to something else. Is this good for rheumatism, doctor? Oh, there's nothing any better than that for rheumatism. And everything throughout the whole of the four floors was for rheumatism. I said to him, well, doctor, when a patient comes in with rheumatism, how do you know which to give him? Well, he said, tell you, I just closed my eyes, and the, one, the first one that comes to my mind, that's what he gets. I said, that's very scientific. I think you're wonderful. It's like in the United States Pharmacopeia. There's 5,000 prescriptions for tuberculosis. 5,000. Every one cures. No two are alike. I said to one physician, how do you know which one of these to give him? I said, tell you what to do. I come to the first page on tuberculosis, and then I, I turn it over page after page, then I close my eyes and I keep turning the page and then I run my finger down and I say hit or miss, I'll give him this. <laughs> he says that's just as good as any of the rest. <laughs> now isn't that scientific? That's medicine. Just think the power that rests in your hands provided You'll make it work. A slip on the sidewalk is a small thing. It happens to millions. A fall from a ladder is a small thing. That happens to millions. The slip or the fall produces a subluxation, and that subluxation is a small thing. The subluxation produces pressure on a nerve, and that pressure is a small thing. And the pressure cuts off the flow of mental impulses, and that decreased flowing is a small thing. And that decreased flowing produces a diseased body, and that is a big thing for that man. And multiply that sick man by a thousand, and you control the physical and mental welfare of a city. Multiply that man by a million, and you shape the physical and mental destiny of a state. And multiply that man by 156 million, and you forecast and can prophesy the physical and mental stasis of a nation. So the slip of the fall, the subluxation, the pressure, the flow of mental impulses, and this is a big enough to control the thoughts and actions of a nation. And that's the power that rests with you. Now comes a man. Any one man is a small thing. This man gives an adjustment, and that adjustment is a small thing. The adjustment replaces the subluxation, that's a small thing. And the adjusted subluxation releases pressure upon nerves, and that's a small thing. The released pressure restores health to a man, and that is a big thing to that man. Multiply that well man by a thousand and you step up the physical and mental stasis of a city. Multiply that well man by a million, you increase the efficiency of a state. And multiply that well man by 156 million, and you have produced a healthy, wealthy, and better race for posterity. So the adjustment of the subluxation to release pressure upon nerves, to restore mental impulse flow, to restore health, is big enough to rebuild the thoughts and actions of the world. So the idea that knows the cause, that can correct the cause of disease, is one of the biggest ideas I know. Without it, nations fall. With it, nations rise. The idea is the biggest idea I know. Oh, if I could have just gotten my hands on Hitler, or Mussolini, and adjusted that subluxation that was making a sane man into an insane raving maniac. 
If I could have done that, by that one act, small as it was, in one man, I could have saved the lives of 20 million people. That's how big that idea is. I've often said, when the time comes when my voice fails, all I want on my mausoleum is, because of his having lived, he added millions of years to millions of lives. Thank you.